Hi, everyone. So welcome to the live stream today. Very much excited for having you uh, in the next week or in the fourth week in our discussion towards the ICA April 22 examination. And welcome, everybody. I see some of you guys joining us on YouTube. We are live on Facebook and we are also live on LinkedIn, whatever platform that works for you. Thank you for joining us on the live stream. Now, we are in the fourth week for our preparation towards the ICA April 2022 examination. And... Um, we have about eight more weeks to go and we will be in the exam hall. And I believe that you are studying, you are putting in the work, you're putting in the sacrifices and you're doing whatever it is you have to do in order for you to pass the examination. So welcome to the stream today. We, were, we are focusing on IAS 16, property, plant and equipment. And we are going to be looking at IAS 16, some examples of IAS 16. And we're going to be looking at the various discussions that we need to have about IAS 16. We started with IAS 16 last week, Friday, alongside with IAS 8, where we spoke about uh, accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates and errors. So we want to just build up on that and find out exactly where we can go and what we can do today in that case so welcome to the live stream uh give me a thumbs up on the video when you join on facebook on youtube share the video let us reach as many students as possible tell a friend to tell a friend because we are looking at ias 16 the grandpapa of all of the accounting standards there are a lot of accounting standards that are connected with ias 16 we have ias 40 we have ifrs 5 we have ias 2 we have um uh, IAS 12, we have IAS 38. So basically, there are a lot of numerous standards that are connected with IAS 16. So understanding the fundamentals of IAS 16 sets the tone for us to be able to uh, really understand the, the financial reporting standards and the accounting standards so that we will be able to pass the examination in that case. So I'm going to share my screen. If there are any questions, you know what to do. You put it in the chat. You put it in the comment section for me. I'm going to be reading all your comments as we begin to uh, go through the discussion. Now, remember also that you can uh, listen to this lecture and many other full lectures on our podcast platforms. So everywhere you get your podcast, you can get access to uh, the Insurer Premium podcast. Just search for Insurer Premium wherever you get your podcast uh, on Apple Podcast on uh, Spotify, on Breaker, on Google Podcast, on Pocket Cast, on Radio Public, wherever you get your podcast from, you just search for Insurer Premium and you can get an audio of this lecture and make sure you subscribe there as well as we grow this community. So let's go straight up into our discussion. We started with our discussion on IAS 16, property, plant and equipment. But we, before we went into property, plant and equipment, we made mention of the fact that when it comes to dealing with the uh, accounting of non-current assets, two things basically we have to take into consideration in that manner. Let's see if we can have a bigger workspace uh, here. Okay, so we said two things that we must understand. There are what we call owner-occupied non-current assets and then uh, non-owner-occupied non-current assets. The principle we established last week was that the owner-occupied non-current assets are the non-current assets that a company controls and that they are using for the day-to-day -day running of the organization. And so such assets will be accounted for in accordance with IAS 16, property, plants, and equipment. But then there are also non-owner-occupied non-current assets. These are non-current assets that an entity controls. Uh, however, the entity is not using it for the day-to-day -day running of the organization. Either the entity is renting it out on an, on an operating lease for rental income or the entity is actually going to be looking at it, uh, holding on it for capital appreciation. So we said in those cases or in such case, then the, it will be accounted for in accordance with IAS 40 investment property. So we started with a discussion on IAS 16 property plants uh, and equipment here. Uh, we spoke about the recognition criteria for property plants and equipment. We said that it must meet the definition of property plants and equipment basically uh, which simply means that it should meet the definition of an asset or the entity should be able to control the assets basically if the entity can control the asset because remember the definition of assets states that assets are resources controlled by an entity so the first starting point is that it should meet the definition of an asset a property plant and equipment number two is that the cost should be reliably measured 
uh, by the entity. And then number three, it's, it is probable that the economic benefits from the usage of the assets will actually flow to the entity. So if the economic benefit from the usage of the asset flows to the entity, then we are going to be having that also there in that case. So that was the recognition criteria, or that's the recognition criteria, and we shared our thoughts on this on, uh, on Friday. Then we came to the issue about the measurement. The measurement. Now, this is going to be a huge aspect that we need to spend a lot of time on. And so stay with me carefully as we begin to unpack these. Now, we said that measurement simply has to do with the determination of the monetary amount to be placed on an asset uh, or on a transaction, sorry, in the financial statement of an entity. So when it comes to measurement of assets, there are two things that we need to note. There is what is called the initial measurement, and there is what is called subsequent measurement. So there is initial measurement and then subsequent measurement. So we're going to begin our discussion with the initial measurement, because that is the starting point on what we want to look out for today. So let's go into it, initial measurement. Initial measurement. Now, according to IAS 16, Property Plants and Equipment, please let me say something here very well. Let me say something here. Uh, I said this on Friday in, in the previous session. Now, in case you missed that, you can check the description of this video. You can watch that video in the description. So you can check the description of this video and you'll be able to watch that video in that particular case. So um, what I said was that the recognition criteria for PPE is going to be the same recognition criteria for um, investment, uh, sorry, investment property that is IAS 40 and also for intangible assets IAS 38. So it's something that you need to pay attention to and be very careful about because the same recognition criteria is going to be there. The initial measurement also will be the same thing. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing on this is that you, you, so that you don't repeat what you have already studied. You don't repeat what you have already mentioned. You don't repeat what you have already said. So when you get to IAS 40 and we ask you for the recognition criteria for IAS 40, just from IAS 16, you know. When we ask you for the initial measurement of investment property, just from the uh, IAS 16, you know already. So the, the points or the lessons are going to be getting across in that particular case for you to understand. So let's look at the initial measurements. Now, IAS 16 simply states that the initial cost of an asset shall be the purchases cost or the manufacturing cost and all other costs incurred in bringing the assets to its present use and all other costs incurred in bringing the assets to, the, to its present use. So the initial cost of an asset, or to be specific of a PPE, shall be the purchases cost or manufacturing cost or construction cost and all other directly attributable costs and all other directly attributable costs incurred in bringing the assets to its present use or condition in bringing the asset to its present use or conditions. Now, you got to be careful here because we're going to unpack all of those things that we just mentioned in that particular case. So two key things I want you to take away. Purchases cost, if we've bought the assets, uh, then purchases cost will come in. Manufacturing cost, if the company manufactured the assets in-house. Uh, construction cost, if we are dealing with assets of permanent structure like building, like work workshop, then such assets are going to be accounted for or will be uh, manufactured or constructed by the entity. 
than any other directly attributable cost incurred in bringing the asset to its present use will be included in arriving at the initial cost of the asset. So that is the starting point. That is the starting point. So let me bring up my slide and then let's expand a little bit on what I'm saying. There you go. There you go. So the initial cost, now I see some of you guys joining, you are welcome. This is the uh, part two of our discussion on IAS 16 property plants and equipment. In case you missed the part one, you can check the description of this video and you'll be able to watch the part one and then you follow up on the part two. Or you can check the accounting standard playlist and you'll be able to uh, watch the videos as well. Please comment in the chat box any questions you have for me. I'm reading, I'm going to be reading all your comments. Uh, so we are live on Facebook. So for Facebook, we'll be in the comment section. And for YouTube, in the chat box, put it in there. Any questions you have for me, please share the video. Let us reach as many students as possible watching the live stream so we can together assist a lot of students preparing for the uh, examination. Okay, so let's go. So when we say the initial cost of the asset, we mean the purchases cost. Now, that is going to be the starting point. Okay, the purchases cost. Now, if we purchase the assets, certainly the purchases cost is going to be uh, our starting point for the discussion. But you have to be careful because if an entity purchases an asset, that it is likely that, and it's outside the country, it is likely that it's going to be paying some import duties and then some taxes. So if there are certain import duties that a company paid in acquiring the assets, those import duties, as far as it relates to uh, the acquisition of the assets, must be included in the determination of the purchases cost of the assets. So that is going to be happening or that is going to be brought. Then we are going to deduct any trade discount. So for instance, if the entity purchased the asset and received some trade discounts uh, because of the amounts involving the asset, those, that discount must be deducted in arriving at the purchases cost to be recognized in the financial statement. Then we said it is the purchases cost and what? All other directly attributable costs. So what are these directly attributable costs that we are talking about? What are these directly attributable costs? Number one, cost of employee uh, benefits. Now, this happens if we are going to be manufacturing uh, the asset in-house or we are constructing the asset in-house and we are paying employees some employee benefits. Now, this is covered by IAS 19 employee benefits. So uh, that is really one of the exclusive standards for level three students. Even though in level two financial reporting, the examiner requires that you have some knowledge about this but cost of employee benefit will be included. Cost of site preparation, certainly. I mean, the way we're going to be preparing the site will be included in the initial cost of the assets. Then initial delivery and handling cost. So for instance, we purchase the assets. Hence, in that case, we are going to be paying for delivery and some handling. So those delivery and handling costs will be included in the initial cost. Then installation and assembly cost, that is also very important. We're going to be looking at it there. Then cost of testing whether the asset functions properly. So the cost of testing the assets, the initial testing. So after installing it, the cost we incur in testing the assets will also be included in the initial cost. Then professional fees. Sometimes we would have to uh, pay some legal fees. We have to pay some consultants. We have to pay certain costs before we are able to finish the construction or the acquisition of the assets. In such cases, those professional fees are going to be included. Then initial estimate of dismantling cost. This is covered by IAS 37, provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets. And when we get there, we're going to be talking about that pretty later on. Then borrowing cost, definitely. That is also covered by IAS 23, one of the standards we're going to be looking out for later on. So if an entity borrows fund to manufacture the asset or to construct the asset, then during the period of the construction of the assets, the interest expenses we are incurring on the assets must be capitalized or uh, included in the initial cost of the asset. And we'll get into that later on when we are looking at IAS 30, 23, borrowing cost, and you will know how it plays out. So based on that, 
This is the pro forma of arriving at the initial cost of the assets. This is the pro forma of arriving at the initial cost of the asset. So when we want the initial cost of an asset, this is what we are going to be adding up. This is what we are going to be bringing up generally at the end of the day. So the purchases cost, pre-testing cost, uh, pre-production uh, testing cost, any legal fees, dismantling cost, manufacturing cost, if the asset is manufactured, then it's going to be happening. So you realize that the last uh, one and then the first one will not be in the same situation because if we purchased it, then we will not manufacture. If we manufacture it, then there will not be purchases cost. So it depends on what the examiner presents to us and how we are going to be actually presenting a solution at the end of the day. So that is the issue about the initial cost of an asset. So you have to be careful because there are certain costs also that an entity incurs that is not supposed to be included in the initial cost of the asset. So let's look at it. So the following cost cannot be included in the initial cost of the assets. So even though they are, th these are costs that the entity is incurring, they cannot be included in the initial cost of the asset. Number one, staff training cost. Our staff that we are training them, that we are training to use the asset, the asset is ready to for use. Whether we train them or we don't train them, the asset will still be used. For that reason, staff training cost is not included in the initial cost of the asset. Instead, it is written off in the profit or loss account of the entity. Then administration and general overheads. Definitely, you cannot include that in the initial cost of the asset in that particular case. Then initial operating losses, you cannot include that in the initial cost of the asset. New facility opening. This is where you're doing commissioning. Like we see here uh, in Ghana, especially Every little thing, it's commissioned with a lot of uh, gangantua events showing off when nothing is really being done at the end of the day. The same thing happens to companies. Sometimes when they acquire facilities, especially build some factories, what they would do is that they, is, they are going to commission it. We are saying that the initial, those costs they incur in opening the facility up or commissioning the facility will not be included in the initial cost of the assets at the end of the day. So these are some of the cost items which when incurred by an entity will not be included in the initial cost of the assets. So once we get our initial cost, what is the journal entry? The journal entry is we're going to be debiting PPE, property plants and equipment, and then we credit cash, bank, provisions or liabilities. Now, you realize that the credit entry there has a lot of items. The reason why there are a lot of items on the credit entry is because it depends on what we are looking out for and uh, the credits that is going to be coming in at the end of the day. What does that mean? If we are making payments with cash, then we will credit cash. If we are making payments with bank transfers or checks, then we are crediting bank. If we are going to be dealing with dismantling costs as per IAS 37, then we are going to be dealing with provisions. And then if the money is outstanding, probably we've not paid it yet, then it will be recognized under liabilities at the end of the day. So these are the issues that we need to talk about, about the initial measurement of an asset. Any questions, please? Any questions, please? I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. This is the part two of our IFRS lectures, IFRS masterclass. And we are looking at IAS 16 property plants and equipment. So if there are any questions, put it in the chat for me on YouTube, put it in the comment section for me on Facebook. I'm going to read all your comments and reply to them all. Okay, so now that we've looked at the initial cost, let's take an example and see how we can recognize the initial cost of an asset. Let's take an example to see how we can recognize the initial cost of an asset. So I'm going to squeeze this up a little bit. Let's see if I can, I can get a shot of it. Okay, let's see if I can get a shot of it and put it in my slide because there is an additional information there. Oh, because I want to see if I can squeeze it up. OK, something like this.
I didn't get everything, but at least got the vital data that we need for our calculation. So let's look at a question here. Okay, so I think I see some comments coming in. I'm gonna read them and we go through the question here. So the preamble of the question said, on March 20, X0, Uka or Yuka Co acquired a machine from Plant Co under the following terms. Let me see the details coming in. Then there's an additional information there that we need to read about. See some comments coming in. Let's see if I can answer them real quick. Then we go. Priscilla Duches Labi said, um, hello, Inshira. Yeah, hi. Thanks for joining us. Priscilla said, please, how do I get access to your class? I've registered, but still not gotten access. You registered but not gotten access. Okay. Yeah, maybe you have to send her on WhatsApp or whatever. Yeah, you send her on WhatsApp and it could be handled. If you have not gotten access, then maybe your enrollment was not successful because when you make the payment automatically, you should be able to get access to the course. I don't know the subject you registered for, but uh, if you're not getting access, it could be your enrollment was not successful. And in that case, there has to be some verification process that we go through before verifying your enrollment. So you can send her a WhatsApp and let's see if that verification can be done before we proceed with the enrollment. Ruth uh, Nyerenda said, hi, Ruth from Malawi. Hi, Ruth. Thanks for joining us on the live stream. If you have any questions, please put it in the chat for me. We are live on Facebook, we are live on YouTube, and we are also live on uh, LinkedIn. St. Ino and uh, Veronica Amenof Amenofe, thank you for the thumbs up and the heart on Facebook. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Okay, so let's go back to our question. If there are any questions, you put it in the chat for me. So we see the list price of the thing, uh, of the asset that we bought. We see import duties coming in. We see delivery cost. So let me go back to my slide here. So we see the list price of the machine. That is 82,000 Ghana. That's dollars, not Ghana. It is 82,000 Ghana. It is. We see import duties. Remember, import duties will be part of the initial cost. So definitely that is going to be coming up. Delivery, mm, that's going to be coming up because, I mean, delivery cost has to be included, definitely. Then we see electrical installation cost. Yes, that is part of installation, so that is also going to be coming up, definitely. And then pre-production testing, definitely that is going to be coming up at the end of the day. Then we see purchase of a five-year maintenance contract with the plant. Oh, if we bought an asset and we sign a five-year maintenance contract, that should not be part of the initial cost of the asset. That should be maintenance is an operating expenses, and if anything, should be recognized in the operating expenses of the entity. So we see that we're going to be adding all these guys up at the end of the day. But let's see, there's an additional information given. In addition to the above information, Yukako has was granted a trade discount of 10%. Wow. So the company was granted a trade discount of 10%. So let's set out our pro forma for the company. And then we are now the requirements of the question. Let's look at the requirements. It says, how should so this is our requirement. I should have even read the requirement before starting. But then it says, how should the above information be accounted for in the financial statement? How should the above information be accounted for in the financial statement? 
So we see the less cost of the machine. So you calculate. Let's look at the initial cost of the machine. We could work two cash columns here. We bring in the purchases cost. So under the purchases cost, we have the list price. The list price here is 82000 Remember we mentioned that if there is a trade discount to be deducted, in this question we are told that they are giving a trade discount of 10%. So we're going to less that. So we less trade discount. That's going to be 10% over 82,000. So that will be 8,200. You subtract that and that gives you the purchases cost, net of trade discounts. That's 73,800. Seventy three eight hundred. Then we bring in the other cost item, import duty. Import duty. That's thousand five. So that is going to be brought as well. Next one, delivery fees. Definitely we have to pay for that. The delivery fee is going to be 22050 Next one, electrical installation cost. Electrical installation cost. That should be part. So electrical installation cost. That's given to us as 9500 Then pre-production testing for 900, that should be included as well. And that is for 900. For 900. Now I want you to stay close with me very well here because you realize that in this, in the question, what I put in the uh, mark there, we realize that we are told that the purchases, a purchase of a five year maintenance contract with the plant or with plants. Like I mentioned, this is a PL transaction for five years. For five years. So it's a PL transaction. So we're not going to include that in our workings at the end of the day. We're not going to include that in our workings at the end of the day. Sorry. So let's derive our initial cost. So let's add this guy up. So seventy three eight hundred thousand five twenty fifty nine five hundred. I'm getting ninety one seven fifty. So that is the initial cost of this plant that we bought. Any questions, please? Any questions? That's the initial cost of the plant that we bought. The only thing that is not appearing here, as you can see, is the maintenance contract. The maintenance contract. But there is another, there is another information in the question. 
Even though it doesn't relate to what we are doing, let's look at it anyways. It says that a settlement discount of 5% if payment for the machine was received within one month. Yuka paid for the plant on 25th March 20x5. Okay, so there was a trade discount, then there is also a cash discount. The trade discount is 10%, that will be included in the initial cost. But the cash discount will be a PL item. Okay, the cash discount will be a PL item. It's like discounts received. Now, the company bought the asset on 1st March. We are told if they pay the thing within one month, they get 5% settlement discount. And the examiner said they made a payment on 25th March. So if they bought it on 1st and making payment on 25th, did they qualify for the settlement discount? Yes, they qualify for the settlement discount. For that reason, there will be that settlement discount coming in of 5%. Uh, that will be recognized in the profit or loss. Now, that is not part of the question literally because that is not what the examiner said we should do but i'm just including it and then finish it finishing it up finishing it up there so the pnl so transactions to be recognized in the pnl So transactions to be recognized in the profit or loss relating to this particular one. Number one is going to be the settlement discount. And that's recognized in the profit or loss. It's an income. So that's going to be 5% of the initial value we got here, 91,750. What do we have? 0 0.05 times 91,750. I'm getting 4588 approximately. So that is the settlement discount. Now, that settlement discount, where do we recognize it? That settlement discount will be recognized in the PL. Now, the double entry for that is you're going to debit. It was it was bought on credit. So we'll debit the trade payables. With the 4588. But like I say always, I mean, you're not going to be writing this down in the exam hall. Then you credit the profit or loss. Four five eight eight. So the settlement discount will be taken to the credit side of the income statement. Okay, of the income statement. But there is a maintenance contract. The question said, in addition to all the payments above, the company purchased a five-year contract, a maintenance contract with the plant. Now, maintenance co contract is going to be recognized definitely in the PL account as an expenses. So since it's for five years, we divide seven by five and every year charge that particular figure. So 7,000. By five is one thousand four hundred.
1,400. This 1,400 will be an annual charge that will be recognized in the PNL account. In the PNL account. To be recognized in profit or loss. Any questions, please? Any questions? I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Give us a thumbs up on the video, Facebook, YouTube. Give us a thumbs up on the video and comment in the chat box on YouTube. Comment in the comment section on Facebook. Any questions you have for me? Something that you would want cl clarity on, then we can look at it. So when we say initial measurement, this is what we mean. This is what we mean by initial measurement. So that's the first part. Of the measurements, initial measurements. But let's go to the second part, subsequent measurements. So after we recognize the assets, the company will start. So we need to find out how we can account for that particular asset in the books of the entity. So on subsequent measurement, there are two issues that we need to understand. So subsequent measurements. There are two models that we're going to be using in that case. I see some comments coming in. Let's see if we can look at it. Okman Vena said, hi, Inshira. Yeah, hello, Vena. Um, I hope you're doing well. Ackman said, please, my question is not on this topic. Okay, so what is it? You can put it in the chat if it is something I can talk about. I can talk about that briefly, then we go. If there are any questions you have, put it in the chat for us. We're going to be answering them all. In that case. Okay, so let's go. So on subsequent measurements, let me bring up my screen big. On subsequent measurement, there are two modules that the entity can use to account for the asset, two models. We have what we call the cost model and the revaluation model. The cost model and the revaluation model. What is the cost model? The cost model is where uh, we carry the asset at its historical cost, less accumulated depreciation, any and any uh, impairment losses. But the revaluation model is where we carry the asset at its revalued amount, that is at fair value, less any accumulated depreciation and accumulated impairment losses. That is the issue there. That is the issue there. So these are the two models, cost model, revaluation model. With cost model, you are carrying the asset at its historical cost, at its initial cost, less any uh, depreciation and impairment as determined. Then on the revaluation model, you carry it at it. Now, this is one thing you have to understand. Um, when can the entity use what? Cost model and revaluation model. In all cases, uh, the 
conceptual framework for general purpose financial statements. That is the Inter uh, International Accounting Standard Board conceptual framework. All assets should be carried at their fair value. In other words, all assets should be revalued at least once a year. So for that reason, it looks like all assets will be using what? The revaluation model. Okay, all assets should be using the revaluation model. But then there are certain assets that are of a specialized nature. There are certain assets that are uh, that requires modification. There are certain assets that cannot be used out of the box. For those assets, we would have to uh, use the cost module to account for them. Okay, we have to use the cost module to account for them. So if the economic useful life of the, sorry, if the fair value of the asset cannot reliably be determined, go for the cost model. Go for the cost model. So it means because there are no buyers, there are no uh, sellers, you cannot determine the fair value of the property. In that case, we will use the cost model. But if it is possible that the people, there are there is a market available and there are people buying and people selling, there is demand there, then what is going to be happening is that the entity is going to be using the cost module in that particular case, okay? So cost module will be used when the asset is of a specialized nature, there are no buyers, there are no sellers, then we uh, use the cost module. Revaluation model will be used when the, we can determine the fair value of the asset reliably. Please note that the revaluation model is also called the fair value model. Okay, the revaluation model is also called the fair value model. That is the issue about that one. Okay, so these are the two modules we have to carry assets at. Now, irrespective of the module you are carrying the assets at, you remember that depreciation is always going to be there. So let's look at depreciation quickly. What is depreciation? Now, IAS 16 has given us a definition for how we can... Uh, depreciate or, or uh, has given a definition on how we can define depreciation. So in a simple language, just for one line, I understand it. We say that depreciation is the systematic allocation of the depreciable amount of an asset over its what? Useful life. Over its useful life. The systematic allocation of the depreciable amount of an asset over its useful life. That is the depreciation. Now, there are numerous methods that we can use to calculate depreciation of an asset or to determine the depreciation of an asset, but two of them will be cardinal or critical in our uh, understanding as corporate reporting students or financial reporting students. So we have the straight line method and then the reducing balance method. The straight line method and then the reducing balance method. We have to look at how we can use these methods. Now, let me also say here that uh, the straight line method usually is used for assets of a permanent nature. So, for instance, if we are dealing with something like building, straight line method will be used. Um, uh, let's say you are dealing with furniture, office furniture, and fitting office furniture. Sometimes the straight line method could be used. But things like plants and equipment, Okay, we use the reducing balance method. Why? Because as the asset ages, the productivity of the asset falls. Okay, that is the idea there. But even though these are just guidelines given, an entity can depreciate a plant and machinery on a straight line basis. That's their choice. If they feel that is the method they can use that will enhance faithful representation of financial statements, why not? They can go for it. But ideally, Planting equipment, they would use reducing balance method. Okay, so what is the straight line method about? What is the reducing balance method about? Very simple. Under the straight line method, what's going to happen is that we depreciate the asset over the economic life of the asset. What does that mean? It means that the same depreciation is charged over the economic life of the asset. So, for instance, if our initial cost is going to be uh, $60,000, and the economic life of the asset is, say, 12 years, at the end of the day, 
then what is going to be happening is that every year we will charge a depreciation of five thousand dollars so the same amount of depreciation is going to be charged over the useful life of the assets for that reason we say that depreciation is charged on the cost of the assets please note that under the straight line method we say that the depreciation chargeable to the p l will be the cost minus the residual value or the terminal value or the scrap value depending on <laughs> whichever is available in the question so we can have scrap value there we can have terminal value there we can have the uh, residual value whatever we have we bring it in divided by the economic useful life of the asset times x over 12. now why am i bringing the x over 12 up i'm bringing the x over 12 in my formula here for time appropriation okay so that if the asset had not been used for the whole year then we would do time allocated if it is used for six months then it will be times six over 12. if it was used for three months before the year end then three over 12 that kind of thing that is what we are talking about here i get in it that's what we are talking about here so that is the straight line method but even though this formula is available under the straight line method, depreciation can also be charged on cost. So it is where the examiner will say 25% on cost. If the examiner says 25% on cost, we are charging depreciation on cost. It means you are using the cost model. It means that you are using the straight line method to calculate your depreciation at the end of the day. That is the issue about the straight line method. The reducing balance method is the direct opposite of that. So with the reducing balance method, we calculate the depreciation on the carrying amount of the assets. Very, very important. So what it means is that under the reducing balance method, you're going to be bringing the cost of the asset. Then you're going to be bringing in any accumulated depreciation on the asset previously. Then you get a carrying amount at the time of the depreciation being calculated. So it is on that figure that we are going to express our depreciation rates in that particular case. So it is on that figure that we are going to be expressing our depreciation rates in that case. So that is also the reducing balance method. In that case, what is going to be happening is that the depreciation charge reduces as the asset ages. And that makes sense. That was what I was telling you about uh, plants and equipment. Because if you buy a plant, it could be very productive in the initial stages. But then as the plant ages, it begins to wear and tear. Hence, its productivity reduces at the end of the day. So what we are saying here and what we are talking about here is that the depreciation you also charge is going to be what? Falling is going to be reducing as the asset ages. For that reason, depreciation is going to be the carrying amount multiplied by the percentage of depreciation which will be given to you in the question. Now, definitely times x over 12. Okay, definitely times x over 12 because time appropriation is going to be critical in that case. Time appropriation is going to be critical in that particular case. Any questions, please? Any questions on these? Any questions? Any questions? Put it in the chat. Put it in the comments for me. I'm going to be reading all of your comments for you as we proceed with the discussion. So once we get our depreciation figure, what do we do? We debit profit or loss, and we credit PP. That's the double entry for provisions. Now, let me say this. You're not going to be showing this debit and credit in, your, in, in the exam hall. The examiner will just ask, tell you how should above be presented in the financial statement. So you are going to be preparing financial statement. So when we say debit P and L, we mean put the depreciation negative because it means you are debiting P and L. When we say credit PPE, it means you deduct it from the PPE for the year under review. You deduct it from the for the PPE for the year under review. So that is the issue about that one any questions please let's see if we can get some questions coming in real fast venus said how is unrealized profit on intragroup trading treated in consolidated financial statement 
you can watch a video on that on the portal uh, on the on youtube you can check the uh how do we call it the playlist on consolidated financial statements there is a specific video on intra-group trading you can watch that video on the portal that is a long thing i cannot uh, talk about it now so you can watch the video on the channel check the uh, group financial statement playlist there is a specific video on intra-group trading then you can uh, watch that video to understand the treatment of unrealized profit because it depends who is selling is it the buyer or the seller then it also depends are we preparing the statement of profit or loss or we are preparing the statement of financial position so you watch that video the explanations are going to be there uh joseph said hey my great man ever good stuff remain blessed amen joseph thanks for joining us joseph uh mumbi uh lots lots Joseph said michael from ghana you are the best sir thank you very much michael thanks for joining us on the live stream as well thanks for joining us david uh Ame, Ameneku said please can you clarify what you just said concerning the pnl entry it will be charged as an expenses yes it's an expenses because you are debiting pnl so it is an expenses Okay, David, it will be charged as, as an expense uh, in the PL account. That's what we are saying. It will be charged as an expense. Yeah, the depreciation will be charged as an expense in the PL account. It's an expense. Now, sometimes it could be added to cost of sales. So the examiner will tell you how the depreciation is supposed to be allocated. So that the examiner will say of the depreciation that has been calculated, 20% uh, of that will be uh, to cost of sales, 40% will be to administration, and 30% will be to distribution. If the examiner makes a statement like that, then whatever depreciation you have calculated, you must share it. But usually depreciation on plants and equipment goes to P&L, Sorry, it goes to cost of sales. So you will be adding it to their cost of sales in that particular case. Any other questions for me, please? Any other questions? Any other questions? Then we'll look at a final slide on this one, and that is going to be revaluation. See another comment coming in. Let's see if I can pick that real quick. Esther Soka said, Good evening. Kindly advise when you will be doing. A, 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 Advanced Audit and Assurance. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, possibly in the cost of next week, we'll be covering some issues relating to Advanced Audit and Assurance. So maybe you can give me a topic that you would want me to uh, treat on the stream. So if you give me a topic, uh, we will be able to cover that on the stream in that case. David Amenyeku, um, I hope you understood my explanation concerning your question. Let me know uh, if that was okay for you. So Esther, you stay connected. Follow me on Instagram if you're not following me. Uh, details will be posted there. Then let me know the topics in advance audit you would want us to cover on the live stream because definitely we will do something uh, relating to that. We'll do something relating to that. Okay, let's go back. The final part of the discussion is going to be on revaluation. Revaluation. Now, like I mentioned, um, the standard requires that assets are revalued at least once a year. Assets are revalued at least once a year. So we were going to be eventually <laughs> revaluing all assets or carry all assets at the revaluation model. So in my table here is a breakdown of the three points at which revaluation will be done and what we do in each of the cases. Now, remember, like I said uh, in the beginning, the slide I'm sharing on this stream is from my new book, Financial Reporting and Corporate Reporting, uh, that I'm sharing from. So, uh, and that's very important for disclosure purposes. So uh, it's from my new Financial Reporting and Corporate Reporting book, which is out and... Uh, 
That's what I'm sharing from. Okay, so let's go. Now, the treatment of revaluation depends on when the revaluation is done. Please stay with me carefully here. This is going to be the final slide, and we're going to be looking at it. The treatment of revaluation and accounting for revaluation depends on when the revaluation was done by the entity. Number one, the revaluation can be done at the beginning of the year. The revaluation can be done at the end of the year. Then the revaluation can be done midway through the year. The way the revaluation is done affects how much depreciation we calculate, affects if we have to make an annual transfer, and affects how we're going to be recognizing the item in the financial statement. So that is very, very important for you to understand. So let's start with revaluation at the start of the year. So if there is revaluation at the start of the year, what do we do? It means because the revaluation is done at the start of the year, what is going to happen here is that we are going to be calculating the depreciation on the revalued amount. We will calculate the depreciation on the revalued amount. That is very, very critical. Then, any revaluation surplus may be transferred from revaluation surplus to retained earnings. And that is going to be the issue about annual transfer. And I'm going to explain that to you. So stay with me. Then any revaluation loss will be accounted for in accordance with IAS 16. And we will also talk about this in a moment as we continue with the uh, discussion. As we continue with the discussion. I see a comment coming in. Let's see if I can take that real quick. Esther said, Audits of historic financial information, evaluation and review. Okay. Let me take a screenshot of that. Okay. All right. Then Apame said, let's see what Apame is mentioning. He said, please, why? Please, why considering 5% early settlement discount on the initial cost of the asset and not on the purchase price? No, 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 no. The early settlement discount is not considered in the initial cost of the assets. Okay? It's not considered in the initial cost of the assets. It is the trade discount 10% that is considered on it. And, and settlement discount is not on the purchases price. It is on how much you owe. Does that make sense? It's not on the purchases price. So after the trade discount is given to you, how much do you owe? You now owe as um, how much? Let's see. Oh, I think I understand your point. I think I understand your point. I made a mistake here. Thank you, Apame. I think I understand your point. The 5%, <laughs> I did it on the initial cost. <laughs> Of the asset, but that included a lot of things. So it should be on how much you owe seventy three eight hundred. Thank you for that. Let's correct that. It should be on the amount we owe after the trade discount, and that's going to be seventy three eight hundred. Okay. Let me bring up my screen bigger now. <clears throat> so seventy three seventy three eight hundred. So it will be on the amount you owe, not on the initial cost. That was a mistake there. 73,800. So that's going to be 3,690. Okay. 3,690. So that is what will be debited to the trade payables. 3,690. And credited to P&L as income in the name of discounts received in that case. Apame, uh, are you okay? Did I answer your question now? That's how we do the treatment. Joseph said, any financial report in an audit book for sale? How much each? Uh, currently, it is the financial reporting book that uh, you can get. It's 120 Ghana cities. And uh, you can... WhatsApp or call this number here, 050-114-9296. So you can WhatsApp that line and uh, details about it will be 
sent to you as and when the book will be available at the end of the day. For the audits, um, we are not selling uh, the audit book because we are revising it. So it is when you enroll in our course, you get the e-versions of the updated book for free, but the hardcover is still in production, so it's not available for sale now. It's not available for sale now. So that is the issue there. Let me know. Okay. So that's the issue on that one. So let's go. So we are saying that if the uh, revaluation is done at the start of the year, then we charge the depreciation on the revalued amounts, then we'll be doing an annual transfer. Then any revaluation loss will also be accounted for separately, and we're going to get into that uh, in a moment. Um, then if the revaluation is done at the end of the year, that one, be careful, because we will charge depreciation on the cost of the asset or on the value brought forward at the beginning of the year. Now, the revaluation is done at the end of the year. If it is done at the end of the year, then we will not charge depreciation in the current year on the revalued amount. Instead, it will be charged on the cost of the asset or on the value brought forward at the beginning of the year. That's very, very important. For that reason, what is going to be happening is that any revaluation surplus may not be transferred. So there will not be any annual transfer. And we're going to be explaining this later on with questions. Okay? So there will be no annual transfer relating to this particular one. There will not be any annual transfer relating to this because the, as the depreciation was not calculated on the revalued amount. That's very, very important. And then any revaluation loss was going to be accounted for the way it will be accounted for. And we're going to be looking at it uh, in a moment. Then when the depreciation or the revaluation is done midway, midway, that is within the year, how do we do the accounting? All right. It means two separate depreciation will be calculated on a pro rata basis. Two separate depreciation will be calculated on a pro rata basis. Now, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? That means that we will calculate depreciation up to the time the revaluation was done. So up to time of revaluation, okay? That will be the first part on a pro rata basis. Then we'll calculate depreciation after the revaluation, up to the year end. So you realize that you're going to be calculating two separate depreciation, two separate depreciation relating to the asset. So these are the three ways or three channels that we can use to deal with revaluation of assets. Like I said, the calculation of your depreciation and treatment of annual transfer, it's based on whether we are revaluing the assets at the start of the year at the end of the year or midway through the year. Any questions on that, please? Any questions on that, please? Any questions on that? Let's see. Uh, Obapa Abena Deborah said, good evening, sir. Good evening. What time do you have FM? Uh, we've not scheduled any time for FM yet in that particular case. So let me know the topics you would want me to treat in FM. And then definitely we will make time uh, to do it on a live stream. Does that make sense? So let me know. Uh, what topics would you want me to treat in financial management? Then you make sure you follow me on Instagram because, I mean, once we receive the topics, we will be able to then schedule a time for that. But currently we've not received any topics really uh, relating to financial management that we have to treat. So if we receive topics and demands concerning it, why not? Definitely, we will cover it on the channel, okay? We'll cover it on the channel. So these are the three ways through which we can deal with uh, revaluation of assets. These are the three ways 
through which we can deal with revaluation of assets. Any questions for me, please? Any questions for me, please? Any questions for me? Okay. Let's see. So that's it about that. So a quick recap. What have we spoken about? We mentioned that the initial cost of the asset uh, shall be, we mentioned that the initial cost of the asset shall be the purchases costs and all other directly attributable costs incurred in bringing the asset to its present use or its present condition. Then we mentioned that when it comes to the measurement of the asset, there are two things we must pay attention to. Uh, that is the initial recognition and then uh, or initial measurement and then subsequent measurement. On the subsequent measurement part, we said there are two models that can be used, the cost module and the revaluation model or the fair value model. What we mentioned was that where the asset fair value can reliably be determined, then the entity will use the revaluation model or the fair value model. But then if the fair value of the assets cannot be reliably measured, then in that case, the asset will be carried at its historical cost less depreciation, meaning we will go for the cost model. Or if the asset is of a specialized nature, meaning that the asset is customized, the asset cannot be readily used by another entity, in which case it cannot be readily sold to another entity, then we're going to be depreciating the asset or we're going to be carrying the asset using the cost model and then the revaluation model. So there are certain conditions that are going to be there generally at the end of the day. Then we said, okay, whether you are using cost module or revaluation module, one thing stands, actually two things stands, that is depreciation and impairment. Now, the impairment part is under IAS 36, and we'll look at that later on in the discussion. But then the depreciation part is what we are interested in for now. And we said there are many methods, though, but two of them stands out, and that is the straight line and then the reducing balance. The distinction is simple, that a straight line method is where we depreciate the assets on the cost of the asset, and hence the same amount of depreciation is charged over the entire economic life of the asset. However, with the reducing balance method, what happens is that we calculate the depreciation on the carrying amount uh, of the assets. Hence, the depreciation charge, charge every year reduces as the asset ages. Then we concluded to say that when it comes to the revaluation of assets, three things we must bear in mind. That is, uh, when is the revaluation done? How do we deal with annual transfers? And how do we calculate the depreciation? Three things we must understand. When is the revaluation done? How do we calculate depreciation? How do we deal with annual transfer? Very, very important. You don't want to take it for granted. And so we say there are three categories of times when revaluation can be done. Either it can be done at the start of the year, it can be done at the end of the year, or it can be done uh, midway through the year. If the revaluation is done at the start of the year, what is going to be happening is that we will charge depreciation for that year on the revalued amount. For that reason, any gain or loss must be recognized in the financial statement, and we'll look at that uh, later. And then we said, for that reason, the entity would have to make an annual transfer, and I'll share my thought on that also. But then if the revaluation is done at the end of the year, then the depreciation for the year will still be charged on the cost of the asset or on the carrying amount brought forward, not on the revalued amount. And then any revaluation gain or loss will be accounted for the way it has to be accounted for. In that case, when the revaluation is done at the end of the year, there will not be any annual transfer for that particular year. For that particular year. Then the final thing is the midway uh, through the year. If, if it is done midway through the year, then we have to calculate two depreciations on a pro rata basis. That is one from the time the asset from the beginning of the year up to the time the asset was revalued. And then second, we'll be using the revalued amount from the time the asset was revalued to the reporting year or the year ended for the entity. So that is the issue that you need to understand in that case and what we have been talking about uh, today. Joseph said, how do I enroll with you? I have Zika technicians from Zambia. Where do I start? with your course. Um, I don't have detail about that, but you can send hi on WhatsApp. 
uh, 0501149296. You can see below your screen uh, the scroller or how is it called? The crawler or scroller, whatever whatever it's called. And the number is there. Let me see if I can pull it up here as well for you. You can call or WhatsApp at 050 114 uh, If you are outside of Ghana, then you add plus 233 to it so you can see the number display below the flyer there in that case. So that is there. You can WhatsApp us and then we can determine what to be uh, a good thing for you in that case. So that's it about that. Okay. Okay. Right, so because of time constraints, I'm going to conclude around here today. We have our advanced taxation class coming up in the next uh, less than 15 minutes. So I'm going to be concluding around here today. God willing, tomorrow we will do the final part of IAS 16, and then we'll take a full question on IAS 16 and find out how we can put the pieces together. Remember, like I said, IAS 16 is connected with IAS 37. It is connected with IAS 12. It is connected with IFRS 5. It is connected with IAS 40. It is connected with IAS uh, 20. It is connected with IAS 36. <laughs> a lot. And it is connected with IFRS 16 leases. So uh, this is not a standard that you'll be like, yo, I finished with it. I understand it. No, 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 no. Because other standards are going to be calling on the principle of IFRS 16. Or we're going to be faced with a question. And then we have to deal with the IFRS 16, IAS 16 aspect of the question before the other standard in the question is also going to be playing a role. In that case, so that is the issue about that. And thanks very much for joining us on the live stream today. Thanks for the thumbs up. Thanks for the sharing. And thanks for the messages and the comments. God willing, tomorrow, same time, 4.30 p.m., we're going to be continuing with our discussion. Remember that you can listen to audio lectures and then get access to some full exclusive audio content on uh, my podcast, Insura Premium, wherever you get your podcast from, be it Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Pocket Cast, uh, Radio Public, Breaker, wherever you get your podcast from, just put in Insura Premium and definitely you'll be able to uh, get my podcast. Subscribe, follow whichever platform you are on and you'll be able to get a notification when we release new content every day, exclusive audio content to help you to prepare well for your examination and pass the examination. So till we meet again tomorrow, you stay safe and you take care of yourself. I'll catch you same time tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. Bye-bye.